around that time he did that in chennai he did three cycles of experiment of actually giving his own monies making sure that the monies are coming back and what was the order book like from so which he was lending i think in in 2006 it was pretty much 5 6 crores by 2010 we had become about 25 crores book okay it was started very small it from started very very small so from 2010 we were a 25 crore book and every two years we were doubling the book okay. so 2012 we became 50 crores 2014 we became 100 crores so by 2014 we had about 30 branches across tamil nadu the way the simplest way in which we define a customer of five star is anybody without whom a common man cannot lead a smooth life our hypothesis in this is that if he has cash flows and if the cash flows are real yeah the cash flows has to get reflected somewhere there are primarily two things in which everybody would like to reflect their cash yeah i mean fundamental to human psychology either you reflect in a better living style yeah or you reflect uh, you know in the asset creation for you and your family yes. we check for evidences for both of this So southern part is the bread and butter of what we do. Even today, I would say about 93% of our book is in southern part of India. But we started expanding slowly into the central Indian geographies. So we are not impatient. I think when we put up a branch in any new state, we will at least wait for 24 months. The first 24 months is a learning period for us. No targets. Hi, this is Sadhar Talwalia. Welcome to 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. Today I have with me Ranga Rajan Krishnan, CEO of Five Star Finance. Five Star Finance is one of the top hundred NBFCs in India, non-banking financial institutions which are available in India to lending to common people who are starting up on their own SMEs, SMBs. Five Star recently went IPO. They were at around twelve hundred crore rupees revenue, six thousand crore plus assets in under management, and I believe you IPO at around two to three billion dollars in valuation. That's right. Yeah, you know, firstly, Siddharth, thank you for having me here. I have uh, heard to quite a few of your podcasts. Very interesting, and uh, you know, I didn't realize the magnitude of what you do until I saw it live <laughs> here. <laughs> But I think kudos to your efforts in sort of making sure that the right voices reach the market. Thank you for having me. So we did an IPO. So in November we went out with an IPO. So that was at roughly a valuation of a little less than about two billion dollars. But I think image right now your valuation must be higher. Yeah, right? I, we uh, price inched up uh, about twenty five percent post the IPO, so we are well over two billion dollars at this point of time. Mm. So right now you are at exactly twelve hundred crores revenue. Yeah, right. And you price the IPO between like fourteen thousand crores, I would assume. Yeah, a little less than fourteen thousand crores is, is what uh, we priced. So what's more relevant in our metrics is uh, what's the book. Uh, so the book is defined as the net worth, which is equity plus you know retained profits, and what's the multiple on the book that you are going with? So that is where generally the you know the NBFCs or the banking sectors gets priced in, and we had went with the IPO pricing based on that, you know as compared with where the competition is. Got. So I want to dive deep into the IPO first, and then sure. into the journey of Five Star Finance. So many startup IPOs, right? Yeah. We have seen. I'll not take names. But like are seventy to eighty percent down from their peak valuations, yeah. which were between like five to twenty-five billion in their number, and they had much lesser revenues than you had. They were not profitable. Sure, you are doing revenues of again like twelve uh, hundred crores, four fifty crores of profit. Yeah, scaled three x in the last three years. I checked your like the uh, DHRP in two thousand nineteen. You guys were at around four hundred crores yeah. in revenue and less than hundred CR in profit. Sure. You scaled pretty well. How did you price the IPO? Right, you could have asked for a ten billion dollar price. <laughs> you know, I think this is a very nuanced question. I, I probably wanted to cover it as the entire IPO journey. How does so it let's, happen? So let's let's take through the entire IPO journey and then finally answer that question. <laughs> yeah. So you know, in Tamil, there is a saying that uh, a man has to get married and he has to build a house. These two are the most important milestones yeah. uh, that a man does in his life, and he will be a different man at the end of an yeah. experience. I want to add one more thing to it, which is do an IPO. <laughs> It's a very, very significant event. Okay. Not too many people get an opportunity to, you know, to be part of that in their lifetime. I'm, you know, really thrilled and happy that I got an experience here. You know, one of the common questions that get asked in an IPO is how much time does it take to do an IPO? Yeah. And the most common answer that you might hear is that it takes anywhere between six to nine months. I think the answer is wrong. It really depends on whom you are asking this question for. Yeah. Our own IPO journey, I want to divide it into three phases. The first phase starts, which is completely internal to the company. 
So from the time that you start thinking that potentially you want to do an IPO, you will have to work hard for at least the next two years, I would assume, where you are getting a series of things right. You are ensuring that your business model is right. Yeah. You are ensuring that it's a predictable business model. It is scaled up. You are not going to give shocks to the market, yeah. you know, one quarter up, the next quarter down. And then there is a lot of team building activities that you'll have to do. You will have to cover a whole host of steps with respect to governance, with respect to compliances, with respect to disclosures that you will have to yeah. do. So that's a, you know, it's a pretty steep journey. In that phase, what really helps is what is the quality of the team that you have internally. Okay. Because if you have a good quality team, uh, the kind of debates, the discussions that you have, each person's diverse views that he brings to the table, that enriches this journey and, you know, makes you, I would say, watertight when it comes to really taking the plunge just before the IPO. This preparation for an IPO, you're not calling it a, a direct preparation to the external world, yes. but this mental preparation or the internal evolution of a company is anywhere at least between six to eight quarters. This is phase one. The phase two is the process part. You know, once you actually formalize that, yeah, this is what I would like to do an IPO with. This is the broad structure and the combination. Yes. You decide to hire bankers, lawyers, yeah. you know, all the external agencies, advisors who come as part of your IPO. This takes about six to nine months. Okay. I think, you know, if your ship is tight, you have, you know, your house is clean. You will be able to give them all that is required. But each of the people who are coming in as part of this phase, they're all specialists. You know, they have done hundreds of IPOs in their lives. Yeah. So as long as you're able to supply them with the right information, they'll take you through this process. This is about six to nine months. I think of the three phases that I'm going to enlist, this is probably the easiest part. Okay. The last part, which uh, in my mind, I would like to call it as consensus building, is the toughest part okay. in an IPO. Because unlike a private round, in a private round, two parties decide on how good is the business yes. model, what's the valuation, what is it that you would like to go ahead with. If you're in agreement, you shake hands and you move on. But an IPO is unlike a private round. It's a completely at the other end of the spectrum. Every company believes it's so unique yeah. and there are no comparables. They are the first in the market. They should be compared with the best of the names. Yes. Probably, you know, somewhere on the other side of the globe. But public market sort of cuts all that bullshit. Yeah. You know, they will want to understand this in sustainable, long-term, simple terms to be compared mm -hmm. with and to be understood with. And you're not dealing with a single investor. Yeah. An IPO can never be successful with one single investor or one single anchor. So you will pretty much meet, you know, anywhere between, I would say, 150, 200 investors during this journey. Wow. And in each of this, you will probably not get more than 60 minutes time with most of the investors. Okay. So in under 60 minutes, right from introducing your company to actually help him build a thesis, consensus, make him work a little more, you know, to create that interest, to understand more and ultimately get them on the common platform with respect to predicting the business model, agreeing on the valuation, agreeing on the time and market supporting to you, right? This is the phase that I would say is 90% not in your hands. You do your best. And hopefully if your preparation, you know, has been really good over the last couple of two, three years ahead of the yeah. IPO, your journey can be a little smoother. But this last part is really the toughest. So the question that you asked, which is around valuation, that really comes towards the last yeah, part. Yeah. I think every company... Till you reach this part, I think you will have a lot of, you know, internal benchmarks on what your valuation should be. Uh, but I think when you go to the market, you know, when the rubber hits the road, uh, you hear multiple perspectives about what's yeah. good, what's not good, who are the real competitors, who are the real comparables that the market is attributing your company to. More importantly, how is the market itself doing at that point of time? You know, for no fault of yours, let's say the, you know, the previous few IPOs have not done well and you decide to do head yeah. an IPO you will have to put a pound of flesh on the table, yeah. right? You know, it's because the same investors are coming in. So it's a combination of all this where you really price it in. So I think that price in which you decide to ultimately go to the market is absolutely market and consensus driven. It's not with you. You will have some benchmarks. Below a particular threshold, you might not want to do an IPO, but I would say it's largely market driven. Hi everyone, before we begin, I would like to share that this podcast is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund led by Amir Sumani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Swami. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category defining tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as MyGate, Quizzes, Planet Spark, Bolt and Clip. To know more about Prime, visit primevp.in. So how did the final number of the valuation of 13,000 to 14,000 crore rupees 
got it i mean technically it's decided by the first few anchors you know who actually put the price on the table okay it's a consensus event at the end of the day the anchor book as you know that sort of decides the pace and the participation levels of an ipo so it's very critical that you have the right anchors for the book and those anchors you know based on all the factors that i just listed out they finally decide to put a price like i said it's a combination you know beyond a threshold the anchors are not interested below a threshold the company is not interested so somewhere you yeah. find the balance at that level and what was the private round valuation that you raised pre ipo see the last round that we did just ahead of the ipo in early 2021 that was when one of our early investors exited completely so morgan stanley invested in us in 2016 and uh, when they decided to exit we had uh, sequoia which led the round so which sort of doubled up its investment in us sequoia came in 2017 they participated again in 2018 so they doubled up their investment in 2021 when sort of morgan stanley exited and along with that we also got a couple of new investors to join the table so we had kkr we had uh, tvs capital who was joining in and we also had uh, investors like norwest who put in more and additional monies at that point of time yeah. that valuation was about 10300 crores so okay. so that happened in early 2021 and you know then finally we did this ipo at that about 13000 crores got it so were these investors happy with that uh, like a 30% valuation jump in part of like one and a half to two years you know i think given market conditions these are great numbers yeah. to do with so i think in general five star has ensured that any investor right from 2014 we had our first round in 2014 with matrix with matrix Uh, that was just a three million dollar round, and uh, you'll be surprised to know that till the IPO, Matrix has not sold a single share. Okay. So they sort of continued to hold to all the shares that they did in 2014-15. I'm sure they are, you know, sitting on on a very good exit uh, multiple. They part sold a little bit during the OFS as part of the okay. IPO. Forget just the investors who participated in 2021. I think every investor in Five Star, this is a deeply value accreting company. and uh, you know we don't do any short term tactics to just get our price up so most investors anybody who has been party to our journey whether it is an investor whether it is an employer whether it is an employee who is you know got shares shares through the esops or a lot of individual investors who sort of bought our shares during this journey i'm sure everybody has been extremely happy with the way that we have been you know value accretive to the shareholders correct so that it's an interesting thought because when the current chairman and managing director mr pati yeah when he came into the business in 2002 the business was not in good shape so we were probably in a negative net worth at that point of time and we were a loss making entity so the dna of the company is not to lose money okay the dna of the company right from that point has been how to make sure that you are absolutely averse to risks you are avoiding losses you are profitable from that point of time so when he turned around the business i think right from 2005 2006 onwards we have never been loss making every year whatever you know we have invested we have not been dividend paying so that has got completely reinvested into the company that mindset has helped us to ensure that any shareholders you know who has participated there are some shareholders who have bought our shares you know prior to 2010 also so i'm sure all of them are pretty happy with the journey that yeah. they have seen with five star so far now let's uh, get to the history of five star okay <laughs> <laughs> you know we share this unique thing i don't know if it's good or not i think it is good yeah. we are the oldest unicorn in the country <laughs> right <laughs> i don't know what is the youngest unicorn and the oldest unicorn yeah. we are a 38 year old unicorn 38 <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> so we started in 1984 okay the company was started by a gentleman called mr rangarathan okay he He did not have a finance uh, sort of background, but I think purely out of his interest and you know his intention to start catering to a niche segment, he and a lot of well-wishers and his friends got together in 1984. They put small capital, you know, these are not uh, people with uh, a lot of wealth. They just put small capital to play, and they started uh, lending to people who are largely ignored by banks. Okay. The products that they started with is two-wheeler loans. three wheeler loans and slowly they also started expanding into consumer durable okay loans. it was a good going because very limited scale very limited aspirations i would say no external capital nobody to yeah. answer to and it was a deposit taking nbfc at that point okay. of time so it sort of gets self funded right you know you are a, you are from a respectable background so people trust you and then give you monies as deposits and you sort of redeploy that in the uh, business and run with it and you give depositors 8 to 9% at that time even higher right you know because we are talking about 1984 yes. and uh, stuff but 
towards the late 90s you know slowly issues started creeping up into the company largely i would say because of the product focus into unsecured uh, loans consumer durable loans and more importantly because large private sector banks started coming into fray okay. at that point of time you had the likes of hdfc bank and icic bank entering into vehicle financing segment in a very big manner at that point of time so a company with balance sheet size of 5 6 crores yeah with very limited distribution scale and you know not having the financial muscle how do you really compete with yeah. you know giants like them so that sort of also you know we realized that at that uh, stage because of the focus on some of the unsecured products yeah the company had uh, not focused on the right set of products it created losses and uh, we were not able to recover some of the money that was given this led to company actually moving into a negative net worth okay. zone around 2002 So, Mr. Lakshmi Pati, he is the current chairman and uh, managing director. He is called Pati, and he got married into the family around that point okay. of time. And uh, you know, he did not have any uh, background in financial services. I think that is one thing that is absolutely great about him. But he took it as an absolute challenge, as to my, you know, it was his father-in-law's uh, business, yeah. and he got thrusted into the business because he saw him suffering, and he wanted to make sure that. whatever contribution that he can do let him do to the best of his abilities yeah. he got his own capital at that point of time so when he critically analyzed the business there were three factors you know that played in his uh, mind the first is who is the customer that the company is serving the company was serving customers who are not catered by the banks and large yeah. financial institutions that's a niche he wanted to absolutely protect that niche yeah because you know you have to build on something that you are really good at point two what is the product in which you are focusing the company was focusing on unsecured products and on vehicles yeah. now in vehicles it is pretty much undifferentiated right because you will realize that within lending there are cash flow based evaluation and there are product based evaluations yeah. product based evaluations are easier you know you don't bother who the customer is whether it is gold or whether it is a vehicle as long as you own a royal enfield i am ready to give you yeah. so much i am betting on the fact that i will be able to repossess and sell royal enfield at a particular price not truly bothered about you know your cash flows or your ability to say your itrs or anything yeah so similar is the gold right you know these are product based evaluations and that's easier now in product based evaluations for a company to compete with giants you will have to generally price it off you know better otherwise why should people come to you whether you are a person who is just a laborer or you are a very rich person as long as you are buying yeah. royal enfield and i think you can buy it mostly you know it is product while cash flow will have some effect but it's largely on product and not on cash flow and large banks would have better distribution they than they will definitely else. have much better distribution deeper pockets so he realized that the product focus we can't build a sustainable model on this product focus and the third aspect of the uh, business was really on what's the business model what he realized is that it's not that people are bad right people are in general anybody who takes a loan has an intention to repay the loan that intention stays good as long as the times are good but everybody goes through good and bad times yeah. i think when the times are bad the same person behaves very differently for different products so the company has seen that you know when you are let's say financing a refrigerator or a washing machine or a microwave oven if times are bad at best you will go and say you repossess the washing machine what do you do with repossessed <laughs> washing machines right you you are not going to get yeah. your money back but probably the customer is not going to behave if let's say the collateral that you have taken is something which is more serious in his life something which is more emotionally attached to his life like house like a house so that is where the thought of mr pati came in mm. that while the customer segment that five star was serving was always good and we wanted to continue on that but when it comes to product and the business model we'll have to alter it slightly okay so give them a product which is more important to them which sort of really helps them go to the next level of their life so when they want to start a business nobody trusts these people so give them don't give them 20 30 000 rupees give them 3 lakhs give them 5 lakhs remove them from the clutches of a money lender okay give them that money but at the same time ensure that they stay absolutely serious till the last emi to that if you take house as a collateral they are not going to be you know uh, behaving to you differently during a good time or a bad yeah. time and that was a spark which came to him so he wanted to experiment that in uh, around that time he did that in chennai he did three cycles of experiment of actually giving his own monies 
making sure that the monies are coming back and what was the order book like from so, which he was lending i think in in 2006 it was pretty much 5 6 crores by 2010 we had become about 25 crores book okay it was started very small it from it started very very small so from 2010 we were a 25 crore book and every 2 years we were doubling the book okay. so 2012 we became 50 crores 2014 we became 100 crores so by 2014 we had about 30 branches across tamil nadu three cycles you know of own monies lent monies coming back profitable business that's when he decided that you know let's take it to the next level he invited uh, growth capital which is important and matrix came as a first partner and what was the valuation they raised the 3 million at very less let me say <laughs> let me not say i wouldn't say less because you know that's not being fair to matrix yeah. uh, it was appropriate but at that point of time with a scale of just about 100 crores you know they came in at a fair valuation at that point of time and our promoter mr pati was very clear that the first investor you are bringing him not for valuation right you know you are bringing him for validation of your business model yeah. with matrix coming into it i think we got noticed in the world yeah here is a company called five star i think they are doing a nice job and that got us into the next you know orbit i would say because without matrix forget about the valuation i don't know how many professionals including me would have joined this okay. company so with external capital coming in the next order is get the professionals to join because that's where you really scale yeah. up build up a good team so between 2015 and 2017 Most of the professionals that you see in the company today got built in the two-year period. You came from investment banking. So I background. came from an investment banking background. I knew this company earlier, and I was sort of informally involved with the company in the matrix round. Okay. So both the investor sort of knows me, and the promoter knows me. So when they pitched to me that you know this side of the story is going to be a lot more interesting and exciting, I decided to take the plunge. Okay. Then between 2015 and 2022, we grew by about 50x. So you spoke oh. of three x when we started, but we yeah. actually grew by about fifty x. We had a hundred and thirty book, hundred and thirty crores book in two thousand fifteen, and uh, you know we just ended with about six thousand two hundred crores of book as of December. So that's a large jump. I think we have done about six rounds of private equity capital, and that culminated in an IPO which we did in April, November two thousand twenty-two. And the money you lent is this still coming from depositors? No. So somewhere you know early two thousands we surrendered the deposit taking license. Okay. because rbi is very particular that if you are a deposit taking nbfc the level of compliance the level of rigor the level of uh, you know mis or you know the returns that you will have to file it's a lot higher than a non deposit yeah. taking nbfc so the company voluntarily surrendered the you know deposit taking license and since then we have been a non deposit taking nbfc pretty much now if you see any new licenses that rbi grants it's never for a deposit taking license So most of the people who still hold a deposit taking license are all older NBFCs okay. which got it at the earlier regime. So so where does your capital come from? So land? our capital comes from three sources. You know, of course, equity, which is the capital that we have raised, and like I said, internal accruals. We don't pay dividends. You know, we are confident that the company is definitely using that growth capital moving further. So the entire we are a you know very good cash flow accruing uh, company. So the entire profits gets reinvested into the business. And third, of course, is the debt capital which comes from banks. Okay. we have uh, more than 50 lenders at this point of time a combination of private sector banks public sector banks larger nbfcs different types of instruments it could be securitization ncds some ecbs that we have taken some impact funds which have invested in us so it's a combination of all that which sort of works got it so now let's dive into the market yeah. right how does the lending market in india look like yeah and especially interested in you know the nbfc market which sure. comes after the big banks because today Every fintech startup wants to <laughs> become an NBFC, <laughs> become a lender, <laughs> become a lender yeah. through their own books, not Correct. through an external NBFC. Yeah. In every NBFC wants to become a fintech. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Both are you know quite difficult. <laughs> <laughs> See, you leave the banks. I think NBFCs broadly, you might want to categorize them as asset financing or product based NBFCs. Yeah. So this is what we covered a little bit earlier. Yeah. Which is easy to scale, difficult to differentiate. Distribution will have to play a yeah. large role. Balance sheet is absolutely important for you to yeah. become uh, big. So I would categorize vehicle finance companies into this, gold finance companies into this. Any product based lending gets into this uh, segment. Got it. Then you have the entire spectrum of you know anything beyond product based. You have housing finance companies. You have uh, you know lab companies. You have business loan companies. You have personal loan companies. You have consumer durable loan companies. any of this needs a different kind of rigor and a different kind of business model that you sort of build different nbfcs depending on their scale strength background experience 
they decide to build you know on a particular niche that they are particularly yeah. good with the market is large because i think in india you know banks still cater to i would say largely the top 20% for various reasons it could be the diverse geography it could be the unorganized nature or the spread of people that who are there or it could be the uh, you know difficulty in assessment or collections yeah. where banks have largely stayed away from the bulk so there are a lot of niches that nbfcs can build over the last few years you will also see the, the importance that the regulator is giving to uh, you know the role that is being played by non banking finance companies in the country it's not a competition to the banks and you know they believe that truly financial inclusion is possible only with nbfcs filling in the last mile so that's the role that the nbfc plays and within that how you build your niche depends on your experience and expectations so you are today a product based nbfc we are a cash flow based nbfc so a product based nbfc is i would say in simple terms where you have a template and you say yeah if he fulfills this template yeah. I, uh, you know you can go ahead and give him a loan of so much the classic example is the royal enfield example yeah. that i gave 2015 royal enfield model somebody who is coming in let's say for a second hand uh, financing yeah. it's a template right please give him so much of yeah. loan it's clear but you can't do that let's say when a guy who is owning a kirana shop is coming to you and asking for a loan you will have to get into the you know the merits of the case how long has it been running is it really running what is his experience of running the store what is the cash flow what are his obligations you get into the details and merits of but the case but the kirana store is not maintaining excel sheet it's not that's where the challenge is and that's where the opportunities a kirana store doesn't have organized data on an excel sheet and you are asking for example a shop or a house as a collector sure. so where do you get the data that is the, will the kirana store be able to pay back let me just retrace a few steps back sudha it's important to understand who is the customer of five star i think the way the simplest way in which we define a customer of five star is anybody without whom a common man cannot lead a smooth life you know we see people who are providing us products and we see people who are providing us services yeah so from a product category it could be anybody who is selling us something through a shop it could be a kirana guy it could be somebody who owns a hardware shop yeah or it could be a service guy you know somebody who is owning a repair shop a mechanic a saloon guy each of these people i think the first question that you should ask is do you really think they have cash flows or do they, they don't have cash flows because when you go and enjoy a product or a service from from them you pay them right yeah. you can see customers walking in you can see you know customers literally paying them he's yeah. doing brisk business so the fundamental thesis is cash flows they have cash flows yeah you know i think if you believe that they don't have cash flows you know you can't yeah. be in this business we believe that they have cash flows now the question is how do you evaluate the cash flows most people you know find it difficult to evaluate cash flows because they they think that you know they don't have any organized uh, way our hypothesis in this is that if he has cash flows and if the cash flows are real yeah the cash flows has to get reflected somewhere there are primarily two things in which everybody would like to reflect their cash flow yeah i mean fundamental to human psychology either you reflect in a better living style yeah or you reflect uh, you know in the asset creation for you and your family yes. we check for evidences for both of this if a guy really says that he has been running this kirana shop for 10 years and on an average he is making 40000 rupees a month yeah we will do a quick math roughly he is doing about 5 lakhs a year and he is doing it for like whatever 10 years yeah. so even assuming that his expenses are there as he created assets worth 5 6 lakhs in his life so we will go to his house we will check you know did he really buy this house or is it an ancestral property what is the kind of living style that he has what flooring what furnishing what size of tv is there a washing machine yeah you know is he have a two wheeler his wife wearing jewelry these are all you know incidental data points sure. which will give you the proof that yeah actually the cash flow is being utilized in the form of either living style or the asset creation sure. that gives us confidence that the firstly the cash flow is real the second part is we have been doing this for about 15 years now yeah so I mean, if I were to take Kirana shop as an example, I think we'd have done about two hundred thousand Kirana shops so far. How many customers do you have? Six hundred and fifty. We have, you know, two lakh seventy thousand live customers. Okay. You know, there are customers who would have closed the loan. There are customers who would have evaluated and rejected. I think we'd have evaluated well over five hundred thousand five so far. So, of which, you know, Kirana shop is the most uh, common. So, there is a lot of institutional knowledge that somebody who's running a Kirana shop, this is the kind of a stock. This is the kind of the road in which his uh, neighborhood is set up his shop. there is going to be an average cash flows that the kirana shop will generate that's yeah. a starting point right that is the gross income level but this business does not run on gross incomes this business runs on net incomes yeah. 
So from the gross income, how do you derive net incomes? That is, uh, you know, personal habits for two Kirana shop guys could be very different. Yeah. Family situation for two Kirana shop guys could yeah. be very different. You know, he could have a sick uh, member in the family for which he is there is a lot of medical expenses he inc- is incurring, or somebody can have a bad habit. You know, he is uh, drinking too much, yeah. he is gambling too much. You know, he is wasting money in online games. Yeah. So these things you will not know as long as you are just thinking that I am evaluating cash flows from a Kirana shop. but i think if you have the time the energy and the patience to spend a couple of days with them and the family doing the proper neighborhood checks you will realize and you will be able to you know create a synthetic cash flow for that firm Hard. which is evidenced through physical assets or the living cent that they have created that forms your basis of what you know what what you really want to give i think the second point uh, siddharth is that you are really not worried or you know it's not that important to exactly pinpoint with six sigma accuracy on what is this cash flow is it 25000 or 26339 yeah. rupees you know it doesn't matter you have to be in the ballpark because then you have enough margin of safety in the form of a debt burden ratio you are not going to give an emi that he has to pay for 25000 yes. rupees your emi is going to be hardly about 8 la- 8000 yeah. rupees or 9000 rupees in a month that's the margin of safety that you play with So when you do this, it's a large opportunity. You know, these are people who don't have formal documentation, but it doesn't mean that they don't have incomes. Now, just because they don't have formal documentation, or just because they don't have transacting banking habits, most fintechs, most large banks do not want to get into them. And But fintechs are getting into them, right? Fintechs are putting bit, QR codes. Yeah, I think the situation is far better than what it was earlier. But it's still it's a large market. I think fintechs are more focusing on larger cities and tiers, yeah. and still take a lot of time to penetrate deeper. but the point really is that cash flows are real you know these are not imaginary cash yeah. flows cash flows are real it's that much more difficult to evaluate the cash flows but if you sort of perfect that model over a period of time the market opportunity that you can get to is literally very very large how many cities you are present in today see we have 369 uh, branches as we speak you know the branches in, are what uh, like a bank branch or a smaller so these are you know when we start with we will start with 500 600 square feet you know i think one thing that we are very conscious about it is given our customer base you can't make the branch too sophisticated people will have to relate to your brand people yeah. will have to feel comfortable walking in so if you are making it like too sort of sophisticated they may yeah. not even walk into yeah. they, they will think this is for the rich so it's our these are all asset light uh, branches always uh, rented we don't own any of this yeah. uh, premises rentals will be starting just about 15000 rupees per month so because of being asset light because of being very very close to the ground most of our branches break even in less than 6 to 9 months so that's a you know pretty mm-hmm. you don't burn cash when you're opening uh, the branches and what is the general geographic location of such branches we yeah. are largely focused between tier 3 cities and tier 6 cities like few examples that the top cities can you give so in tamil nadu you know we are there in very very small locations like edapadi nagarkovil takkalai tiruchendur in um, you know in if you take karnataka we are there uh, apart from the big cities we are also there in many many uh, smaller cities we are there in a lot of places in north karnataka in maharashtra we are there in places like solapur sangli okay. pandarpur in madhya pradesh we have about 40 branches today so in andhra pradesh which is often an ignored market we have more than 100 branches only in andhra pradesh okay so it's a large market we believe that tier 3 to tier 6 or tier 7 is a very big market because most larger financial institutions do not get there and you know we are displacing money lenders wherever that we go god so you are not really competing with other nbfcs or banks yeah. yeah so that's the core of what we do we don't if you were to take how many loans that we take over from other nbfcs and banks it be like pretty much nil most of our focus has been how do you get people from unorganized borrowing or you know the money lenders that they are trapped with into coming into an organized fold multiple advantages right when they move from unorganized to organized they are coming into a safe zone their properties will be handled in a better manner yeah. we are regulated by rbi i mean tomorrow there is an issue there is a clear customer protection that you can do but what if you you know malinner is going to act in a unreasonable manner yeah so those are advantages and people see that brand and trust getting built over a period of time and they feel comfortable walking to us and you are only present in the southern part of india so southern part is the bread and butter of what we do even today i would say about 93% of our book is in southern part of india but we started expanding slowly into the central indian geographies these are about 3 4 year old we have presence today across maharashtra madhya pradesh chatisgarh and one branch in up okay so these are more recent vintage uh, states now i think one learning or one strong belief that we have 
is that this model takes time to build in each state you can't just like that you're not in a manufacturing setup where yeah you are successful in tamil nadu automatically will be successful in maharashtra it, yeah. it doesn't work like that right you know that state has a character in that state you have to form the team right in that state you will have to understand the land records really well it takes its time so we are not impatient i think when we put up a branch in any new state we will at least wait for 24 months the first 24 months is a learning period for us no targets but in the first 24 months we want to really see which are the employees first of all we are able to attract how loyal are they how competent are they what is the leadership that is getting formed in the particular state any customer frauds any political influence what are the challenges with respect to establishing title and land records in a particular state at the end of this 24 month journey we will be pretty clear should i want to press the accelerator in a particular state or should i want to go even slower depending on you know what works out then we decide to expand faster and you also close branches actively so unfortunately in lending you can't close the branch because you have lent money right yeah. you may stop doing new, new business lending. but if it's a mess you don't have the choice of walking yeah. over right you have to make sure that you are cleaning the mess uh, touchwood you know we have not closed the branch but what we can potentially do let's say if we realize the location is wrong we will merge a branch with another branch okay so maybe you know there are two branches which are too close to each other or you know in some uh, sense you know one branch we we may have had people issues so in that uh, branch we will probably merge it with a more senior branch or right. a more stable branch in that location we can't close a branch yeah and you are also in like all southern states even kerala except kerala okay why uh, <laughs> <laughs> because of the gambling habit <laughs> no I, i i wouldn't want to say you know kerala as anything negative yeah. uh, but you know it's a state which is slightly different from the four southern states everybody is by lottery uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know i don't want to comment on that <laughs> but what we have seen so far is that for a non kerala state nbfc yeah. to go and establish and be successful in kerala it's difficult so unless you are doing your homework right and unless you have really understood you know the culture there and you are yeah. good there you can't just automatically go and replicate what you have done in the other states we will certainly enter kerala i don't think we have any bias against uh, yeah. kerala but you know it it take its time so nbfcs right there are 1000 nbfcs in india today more more than 1000 yeah. what would be exact 10, number 10000 at least 10000 yeah. nbfcs yeah. 10000 nbfcs in india so let's say you are among the top 100 yeah. right now who are the top 10 today so the big daddies of nbfcs will be you know the bajaj shriram mahindra i think quite a few you know listed ones they'll be the top i think today if you were to look at rbi has been pretty proactive in sort of because it's clear that you can't have the same set of regulations for the 10000 yeah. nbfcs right you have limited set of banks it's easy to regulate a bank but how do you regulate 10000 nbfcs you think they are not given a new li- banking license a proper in ages correct <laughs> but when it comes to nbfcs even today people get licenses but not everybody can be painted with the same thing okay. so rbi got this uh, scale based regulations about a year back and as per that there are three scales or three levels in which they treat nbfc there is an upper scale upper layer middle layer and a lower layer yeah upper layer you know it's more or less a top 10 15 nbfcs and the upper layer regulations are largely almost in line with that of a bank okay because they don't want to see this regulatory arbitrage between a bank and an nbfc yeah. so any arbitrage which existed early it's sort of getting plug yeah. plug now highest level of regulations because they pose the highest level of risk systemic risk to the entire sector okay. one fails one fails i think potentially you know it could have disastrous effect yeah. then comes the middle layer middle layer are except the bottom layer which is like sub 1000 crore companies uh, everybody else is in the middle layer even in middle layer rbi has been i would say pretty much proactive over the last few years in ensuring that firstly any regulatory gaps are getting plugged and secondly formally recognizing the role and the importance of nbfcs in the sector at one point of time nbfcs were probably not enjoying the same mind space that they enjoyed today uh, earlier because it was a shadow based uh, lending people were not happy about the practices people were not happy about the regulatory oversight that rbi can potentially have on these entities but that pretty much is plugged today more regulations more in line with the uh, banks but that also in line brings the trust element brings in line the fact that yeah you know your books are clean that brings in new lenders today banks take more comfort when they're lending to an nbfcs because you know the regulations are that much more cleaner books are that much more cleaner they are coming on par with yeah. banks 
that is the role of a regulator and that has really helped over the period for example the way you are positioned in distribution is your first difference yeah right the tier 5 tier 6 that you are present in the second is the brand that you have built over a period of time and third is your customer base the yeah. more unorganized that you can enter so i don't agree with the order but uh, <laughs> <laughs> i think the first is the we are a category creator yeah today it's fashionable to talk about lending to small businesses 20 years back it was not so at that point of time when somebody decided mr pati decided that yeah this is the space to go and really build a niche so the first differentiation is somebody to have the conviction and courage to get into the sector there were no rules right how do you lead to them how do you assess cash flow yeah. today you are asking me how do you assess kirana shops with you know all the sophistication that we have yeah with credit bureau penetration with chandan accounts with mobile penetration with alternative data we are asking this question imagine the situation 20 years, 20 years back it was a very different uh, market so i think the first real differentiation for us is we understand this category deep enough we created uh, we were one of the first few players to create this category and we had a free run for the like first 10 15 years so there is no fomo you know there is no external threat or a pressure for you to grow at a particular pace yeah. your own capital your own customer base take your pace take your time understand what works slowly build you know and it's purely his own money or the company's own money right no external capital so you are very careful about every element of business that you build that is the niche that we have created so it's about the customer it's about the business model that got built it's not copied today if somebody were to start you know a similar business it's very difficult for them not to get distracted or not to get influenced by other business models sure. but i think we did not have that i think that worked to our advantage in terms of how, how do you build the second is uh, you know siddharth really is the team that you have built with because many nbfcs maybe even bigger than us of uh, or whatever scale i'm not sure if they have focused as much on building a right team but i think uh, you know if you do take the time to understand what is our second layer yeah you know, there is the promoter mr lakshmi pati but i think if you were to go to the management team we have 21 people at the management team level in five star each of them coming with very very rich experience backgrounds you know working in larger banks they have come and uh, been here that sort of provides a very very stable second line management uh, team level right. which is a very you know i would say refreshing niche that you are building in an nbfc because one of the things that uh, an nbfc will struggle beyond a point of time is that what is the team you know what's the, is it dependent on one person is it dependent on you know few people but i think when you are crossing that niche when you are building something far more sustainable that differentiation is going to pick up pace Got over it. the period of time as we scale and let's say uh, right now you would be at around 70 or 80 rank yeah uh, in, in india yeah is there an aspiration to go to the top 15 top 20 in the next couple of years yeah you know i'm going to be careful about <laughs> the way <laughs> i'm answering this question everything has a time and place yeah. right you know you don't want to be rushing to that spot by doing something which is not good for you if you are diabetic you can't have sweets yeah. right i think just because the other person is having sweets yeah. if you start eating sweets and it's not good for your health you are going to affect yourself we have a similar philosophy right we will grow in a pace that is comfortable to us we will grow definitely much better than the industry average growth which means our rank will improve right but will it happen in you know few years will it happen in 10 years that's a difficult uh, guess okay. we will we continue to believe that we are serving a very large market we are in a unique niche of you know having understood the market well having 20 years of experience in what we do and building a sustainable model yeah. with uh, on top of it you know our market is not something which is contracting our market is not something that is seeing so much of competition today that people are just falling yeah. away we are in very early stage curve from that perspective so we have a long runway so with that said i don't want to attribute whether we are aspiring for a 10th rank or a 15th rank for sure you know the interest is going to be on how do you gradually and steadily improve your rank and let's say today i am a founder and i want to build an nbfc without any prior experience yeah. what is it required by rbi to build an nbfc i see there are the regulatory requirements are pretty simple right you will have to apply to rbi today you have to have a minimum of 2 crore capital of uh, own capital or borrowed capital anything it's equity of the company yeah. right so you could have investors for that so rbi will do its uh, diligence if you have pretty much zero experience 
the question is rbi will say you know why go and give a license to you but you may not have the experience but your t- team may have yeah. an experience i think if you are able to build something and then apply for a license that's probably the cleanest way to start rather sure. than buying an nbfc yeah. for a license applying for a license rbi is pretty proactive with that potentially you will get a license that how I, much time we have not applied so but what i hear is maybe in the you know 6 to 8 month uh, time zone you will get an answer from rbi got it. so it's a pretty transparent process so rbi is one of the real i would say uh, proactive regulators you know it's not that you are not going to know where you are you will be reached out to you will be asked questions you will be asked for additional information but you will get an answer and how many new nbfcs are created in india every year i don't have a specific number but i'm assuming that it will be a few hundreds okay. but more than that rbi has also been proactively cancelling a lot of defunct nbfcs okay. which hold a license the 10000 number that i told you must have been about 13000 plus 3 4 years back okay so there are consciously 3000 4000 nbfcs license which have got cancelled over a period of time and if you go to rbi's website so you know i think every week or something like that you keep getting mails from rbi the following nbfcs license are cancelled okay so it's both ways right net net i don't know if it's increasing uh, because net net i don't know if 10000 serious players exist in this country people got an nbfc license for various reasons in the past but i think the way the eg- regulations will evolve over a period of time you may not have 10000 you may have 2000 nbfcs but pretty much serious in trying to penetrate and create a niche of what they want to do and my you know towards your business model do you want to keep on being what you are and expand your distribution or you want to let's say become a fintech also and start like digital lending what other people are doing see technology has to be embedded in any business that you do yeah. there are no two thoughts about this forget about even financial services whether you know you are in manufacturing today yeah. you are in services today you are in uh, steel manufacturing you are in in a hotel business you are in fmcg business anything that you do today i don't think any business can afford to ignore yeah. the role of tech we are pretty clear about that so that is the easy part right but how do you integrate tech in a manner that is not too intimidating to your customers and in a manner that where you are not missing the fundamentals of your own business that's the key we will integrate tech we are investing in tech we are you know absolutely integrating tech into anything that we do which will enhance efficiencies but does that mean that you know i am aspiring to give a loan in 2 minutes <laughs> yes. a seven year loan <laughs> in 2 minutes i am not sure our thinking today is that in lending the art is collecting it back right and uh, i don't know it's pretty obvious but i don't know if you really think about it the lender makes his monies only in the last few emis if you have let's say a 60 month loan the first 55 months if he repays well you don't make monies yeah. you know you are getting your principal back you are you know repaying your borrowed uh, monies you are meeting your operating expenses the last 5 emis if it, if it comes properly and on time that is where you really make a profit so you have to think that far if you are giving a 60 month loan and you are you know trying to create a zepto <laughs> an equivalent model in an nbfc <laughs> where i know i want to instantly deliver yeah. and instantly i am not sure we want to compete in that yeah. you know let me not say whether it is right or wrong but i am not sure if that is really instead i want to see how do i you know potentially i like i said i have experience of over uh, evaluating 200000 kirana stores how do we digitize this how do we digitize and you know get this as an institutional knowledge and not an individual knowledge how do i sort of get ai or a program which sort of understands this and provides us early warning signals about what could be right or wrong how do i create a customer scoring model in the absence of large alternate data which is available for the top 20% of the country so technology will 100% be infused no doubt we are very serious about what we want to do and uh, we are definitely investing across various things in uh, technology but is it going to be in the manner in which you have you normally understand the way the technology is advertised in a, in a fintech model maybe we will not compete in that so i don't know if you will want to call ourselves a fintech yeah. uh, but tech getting into fin is something we will do okay Uh, ranga you joined as a ceo of the company in 2015 yeah. having 7 to 8 years of investment banking correct experience prior to it right and i think after 3 to 4 years of being a ceo you were elevated to the ceo of the company correct right and i think today mr patil is like 
hands off no 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 absolutely <laughs> not <laughs> he is a very hands on promoter but you continue with your question <laughs> yeah so being a ceo and a non founder do you think it's a way that indian companies are going towards because traditionally we have been founder led if you see the large houses correct very interesting question uh, siddharth so i think just prior to joining uh, five star i had close to overall close to about 12 years of experience yeah. so i started my career with hdfc bank then uh, i was working with standard chartered bank i decided to do a second mba i went to isb yeah then i worked with the world bank group for about 2 years yeah. then i had the investment banking experience of yeah. close to 6 years now it was during one of those stints in the investment banking experience that you know both the investor who invested in five star matrix and the promoter they knew me both of them uh, knew me at some level and they wanted to explore if this is something that i want to take up you know honestly at that point of time it was a bolt from the blue Uh, right because the company was about about just about 100 crores yeah. 130 crores i remember the first thing that i checked at that point of time is what is the promoter salary <laughs> uh, <laughs> i took the balance sheet and i wanted to check and i was you know pretty depressed when i saw that his salary was less than what i was earning that time <laughs> so i was not sure you know whether this is even going to work for me not going to work for me i took 4 months to Make constantly engage with the promoter not just within myself i had to discuss with him at multiple levels multiple backgrounds different environments various things that i really wanted to be clear what is the intention of the promoter is this something that he is trying to do just as a, a short term gig to uh, satisfy an investor who is just coming or is he like very serious about taking it to the next level giving control away that's a big thing yeah not fully but even partially right you know it's a very big decision for a, a promoter so yeah. i i remember in that phase having asked him extremely difficult uh, questions like what were uh, some of the questions that no, were so I that w- <laughs> <laughs> our audience who are aspiring to be you know you know i was i remember at that point of time my first interview happened in uh, in five stars office which happened to be in the first floor of the promoter's house so the office itself was in the house how many people were there about 15 20 people 15 people core people yeah. and then field people correct so you know i think i remember asking him this is not how i aspired yeah. uh, to be so will you eventually change your office he said yes today he said i have done this to save cost nothing else but i think you know as we grow if this is important yes we will do it i remember asking him a question i am not sure if your auditor is right will you change your auditor so very you know huge questions and why are you getting me in and what if let's say you are not happy with me 6 months i am leaving a very high flying career yeah if you are not going to like me in 6 months you will just say you lose nothing huh. but i have lost something which is big so a lot of this tough questions and situations we both sort of acted out over 4 months and then came a point where he said i have told you everything that i know <laughs> <laughs> now it's for me to for you to decide he said i was in a similar situation in 2002 when people asked me to finally take a decision i asked so many questions but beyond a point they'll say yeah, yeah you now is the time to jump so i decided to jump at that point of and time and you took a uh, same salary no no, no i cut. came in with at least a 50% wow. cut in well, my uh, what, salary why did you do that no, right see i was very clear that when i was coming here i'm not coming in for the salary i was coming in for the upside in the form of stocks okay so i really negotiated hard on the stocks you know I was you got ch- esops at that time absolutely yeah so i negotiated hard on the esops and the promoter was kind enough to absolutely agree to my he saw at least the our interests are aligned you back know? then esop understanding was very poor in india right in 2015 because you know for me i had done multiple esop structuring you know with the yeah. clients that i had worked with but you are right i think when i spoke of esops the founder asked me a lot of questions so he was asking me how does it work you know what price what is the wasting what is the expense for the company but both of us were clear that we will be absolutely transparent yeah. and then he has to take a decision at that point of time he was generous at uh, that point and i was clear that yeah if i am taking this kind of a risk it's better to keep the risk equity oriented yeah. and not uh, your 50% salary you will catch up at some point yeah. of time but you can't catch up a valuation you know of that uh, level ne- ever again if the company were to go in the and right track. you joined at the same as a matrix valuation uh, just at the matrix valuation right and the promoter was kind enough to give me the uh, esops at face value and the point of time, not even the matrix valuation okay right because he said 
you're the first professional who is coming and you know sort of trusting uh, me here so if it means that i'll have to give it to you at uh, face value i'll give it to you at face value for the first two three people he did that and then it became the matrix valuation and then it became the next round valuation and so on so that is a you know it's an important uh, phase it's good that we engaged in that deep discussions right at the beginning because we understand where each of us is coming in from yeah. and uh, it's not that we don't have disagreements right but i think that fine balance that we maintain between a professional and a founder the energy and the strategy of a founder that coupled with the discipline of a professional it's a great combination for a company i honestly believe that at some level today there is being a founder is too glamorous <laughs> uh, i'm not sure if it's good for all it's good for some but we see more success stories than multiple failure stories we don't see graveyards we don't see at all so you should be humble enough you should be very clear about evaluating what your strengths and weaknesses are if it if you're not a founder it doesn't matter right but if you can hold hands with the founder and you are helping him scale this businesses uh both career wise and uh, rewards wise you will be fairly adequately rewarded during this entire journey so it's a very rich journey but you will have to find the right founder and the right professional fit do you ever think that you will start from zero uh, ever again ever again <laughs> one thing i have learned in my life is not to predict the future <laughs> be open minded things will happen things will uh, come but i am pretty happy about the position in which i am there and the journey that we have crossed over the last about 8 years so you know let future decide its course like ipo is a great milestone right yeah. being being a professional Absolutely. you became a ceo Correct. took yeah. a company to ipo Correct. many professional joins after an ipo so they never witness that Correct. process they never witness that uh, <laughs> process no uh, like i said i consider that entire ipo experience it's absolutely no match to whatever experience i had as a banker yeah now as a banker you would have been part of many of this ipo but you are you are not in the ring yeah right you don't know what it means to be the team or the founder who is running the ipo what emotions that they go through what challenges and you know at some points of time i felt how helpless the bankers are when you are on the other side right so it's a very different journey i am very happy to have been part of this entire scale and the ipo so how do you and the promoter manage on separate responsibility so that you don't step into each other's shoes often so over the last few years what we have been doing is that we are in multiple states so we exchange responsibilities based on states so there are uh, some states that i handle exclusively some states that he handles exclusively of course we are constantly you know in sync with each other in terms of making sure that directionally we are right and uh, understanding the nuances of what works in a state what has not worked in a state and we also rotate this so that he gets the experience of the states that i have handled mm-hmm. and i get the experience of the states that he has handled so that has worked really well instead of you know one person pulling the engine now if there are two people and uh, even the team sees you as pretty much flexible between the two anybody can come for a review anybody can ask questions and anybody can you know take it to the next level that is an advantage that you are creating as an organization in the last 8 years right first being a ceo and now a ceo what are the things that you have changed in the company that you thought could be done better and what are the things that you have retained so i remember you know the when i joined in 2015 after the first day and the second day i had to come out with a long list of things that i <laughs> didn't understand or wanted to yeah. change mr pati you know he heard me patiently and he said for the next 6 months don't suggest any changes <laughs> <laughs> he said anything that you say yeah maybe there is a lot of merit sure. in it but i think first before suggesting a change you should understand why we are doing what we are doing it's a very it's a deep thought yeah right so I understood you know the merit of what he said because you can't effect a change if people are perceiving you as an outsider yeah you have to first become an insider you know and you don't need to change everything just because you have come in if you see start seeing everything as wrong in front of you there is no end to it yeah right it's not a political game where yeah. you know opposing party has come <laughs> in and then you have started so everything is wrong yeah. and you will start from yeah. scratch when you start doing that you realize why something is working in a particular sure. manner and what's the pace in which you have to change a few things see my biggest contributions i wouldn't call it change but my biggest contributions act- actually been to build teams right the management team or forming the core team is an extremely important task so that i think i really helped the promoter with that tech interventions which have happened capital raising so that was coming naturally to me the six Because rounds of banker. capital raising i think pretty much you know i was i was like a banker so no bank was working the other side 
pretty much shoulder to shoulder you can uh, try to see how the best structuring is possible how the best valuation is possible how the best terms are possible that's a very important uh, journey because if you have let out too much of equity or if you have got into a wrong term with a potential investor both these are dangerous yeah. in the journey of a company so my interventions are more towards that and actually giving the confidence to the promoter that yeah this we can scale it 100x yeah that comes when you are structuring it right you know you are thinking about scale in anything that you do these are my biggest contributions thank you so much ranga i think this podcast is a master class master class in how to operate and run a like a five star nbs <laughs> <laughs> thank you sadat pretty much enjoyed uh, discussing with you i don't know how you jump from one topic to the other to the other sector but you go deep into each of those sectors and like i started in the beginning having done more than 200 episodes full time with this kind of a rigor and this kind of a passion uh truly you know it's it's uh, it's inspirational to see you doing this continue the good work i will definitely be watching each of your episodes <laughs> from now thank you <laughs> thank you so much